excited to uh, introduce him to you and his talk, Why Machine Learning Works, A Search for Simplicity. And notice, if you haven't already, the number of slides. Let's <laughs> 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 welcome uh, George. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for the great introduction. Um, again, my name is George, and I'm very happy to be here to share some of my research with you. Uh, and I'm going to be talking about a question that's kind of near and dear to my heart, which is the title of this slide, or of this talk, which is, Why Does Machine Learning Work? So if you don't know much about machine learning, I'll give a brief introduction as to what that means, uh, and then discuss a search framework that I've developed in order to answer this question in what I feel like is a, a very nice way. And within that framework, I'll share some theoretical results that I've proven, give an application of this sort of thinking to a real-world problem, and then briefly discuss some future work. So machine learning is the study of systems that automatically learn and tend to improve with experience. And so what this means is that these systems will make systematic use of data, which is kind of this automatic learning portion, and then they tend to, to improve their predictive performance with more observations. And so that is the improve with experience. And what this usually consists of is you have something that is not observed, something that's latent, and you're trying to recover it based on what you do observe. So this will become kind of a, um, an important concept in this talk, which is why I want to introduce it early. So what does machine learning look like? So let's say uh, you are Amazon and you have product reviews, and you want a system to automatically determine whether this is a positive or a negative product review. That problem is called binary classification. You want to separate out your instances into two sets, those that are labeled positive and those that are labeled negative. Here, I've represented the positive instances as these smiley faces and negative as the frown faces. And let me move my cursor because that's going to distract me in my talk. <laughs> <laughs> and so right here, what we have on the left are our instances. And so you, say, you may say, those do not look like product reviews, right? What they are are supposed to represent a featureization of a product review. So machine learning methods do very poorly with kind of these unstructured bags of things. So what we really like to do first is to represent things in a form that we can do something with, which is usually some sort of vector. And so you can imagine that these different colors are different real values and you have some fixed length vector. And now we can represent every product review as this fingerprint, let's say. And so in training, we're given our instances and we're also given the associated labels. And our job as a machine learning algorithm is to learn this transformation that occurs from features to labels. If we've done our job well, we're later given a test set where we're just given the instances, but we're not given any labels. And so our job is to correctly produce the labels for these testing um, instances. And so this is kind of a canonical machine learning problem, and we'll, we'll stick with this binary classification for the remainder of this talk, but the results in this talk apply much more generally. So machine learning works, um, if you're not aware. It has been applied. <laughs> It has been applied to a lot of different fields, things like finance, things like um, e-commerce, sports, computational biology, um, and it's being applied to more and more fields daily. And furthermore, we have this rich and elegant mathematical theory that explains why machine learning works, which is called statistical learning theory, which is very nice. However, concisely explaining why machine learning works can often be difficult. Because if somebody asks you, well, why does machine learning work? You can't just give them a textbook on statistical learning theory, right? That's not a very good approach. So we can imagine that we're in the situation where maybe we're in an elevator with someone who's like a very uh, a CEO or maybe a very smart undergraduate student, the kind that you have here at Harvey Mudd, and they say, I keep hearing about machine learning, and it's, it's so successful. Why does it work? So being erudite scholars that we are, we can imagine that we we start saying, well, of course, uh, for classification, empirical risk is guaranteed to be close to actual risk, as long as you have sufficiently small VC dimension and many observations, to which the person will probably just stare at you. <laughs> and if they're brave, they may ask, well, what's a VC dimension? 
So you continue on, well, okay, um, imagine you want to shatter a set of K points embedded within a space. The capacity of your class to generate hyperplanes that can group any, and then all of a sudden they reach their floor. And so <laughs> you've totally missed out on your opportunity to explain why machine learning works. And so this is a very bad elevator pitch. So this is not incorrect. This is actually um, drawn from statistical learning theory, but this is a bad way of framing it for someone who isn't already familiar with that area. So the goals of my research have been to try to improve on this elevator pitch and specifically to give answers of increasing complexity um, to this question, why does machine learning work? So if I had one word to share why machine learning works, that word would be dependence. If I had one sentence, I would say because what is seen tells us something about what is unseen. And if I had an elevator ride, maybe I'd give a paragraph. I'd say that we're trying to recover some object based on observations. Dependence within the problem determines how informative each observation can be, whereas our assumptions and biases determine how informative each observation actually is. And then information theory governs how fast we can recover this hidden object, given the dependent structure, given our assumptions and biases. It is my hope that throughout this talk, you'll begin to see why each of these answers is justified. And so at a high level, my research has been guided by this question, and it's to offer a concise and correct answer to why machine learning works based on these two ideas, this idea of dependence and this idea of search. And then to reformulate much of machine learning, things like classification, regression, clustering, as a type of search problem. And once we've reduced machine learning to search, we can now quantify the difficulty of search and determine what makes searches successful. Because if we can determine what makes searches successful, we've now also determined what makes machine learning successful because we have reduced that problem. And this is good for trying to apply this to the real world, right? We don't just want to come up with these theorems that are interesting. We want to be able to improve the lives of others um, through machine learning. So one such place is hyperparameter optimization, which is no coincidence that I'm mentioning it because that's the applied problem I'll talk about in the later part of this talk. Okay, so now let's look at the search framework. I, I said that I've developed a search framework to answer this question. Where did that come from and what does it look like? So Tom Mitchell wrote a paper in 1982 entitled Generalization is Search, in which he argued that binary classification, the type of problem we saw at the beginning, could be viewed as a type of search through a space. And specifically, he envisioned two spaces. So you have a hypothesis space on the right, which is the search space, and you have an instance space. So remember I said that binary classification is the splitting of our instances into two sets. We have a positive set and a negative set. So you can imagine that one hypothesis in this space selects out some subset of instances, labels those as positive, and then the complement of that set will be the negative instances. A different hypothesis, like H2, maybe selects out a different subset and labels those as the positive instances. Whereas H3, maybe it just selects out this instance. But what we have is in trying to find the correct labeling, we're essentially trying to find the correct set of positive instances. And so we're doing effectively a search through this hypothesis space. So this is kind of the motivation for viewing machine learning as search. But this is in binary classification. But it can be thought of more generally in a lot of different machine learning problems. Because machine learning, typically you have some class of models that have parameters. And you need to determine which parameters to use based on data. So you can think of it as approximately a search through a parameter space more generally. And this applies to things like classification, but also things like multi-class classification, where you don't just have positive and negative labels, but maybe you have a small set of labels. It could apply to regression, which is where you're trying to predict not a label, but a real value based on features. Uh, clustering, which is now moving into unsupervised learning, Parameter estimation, if you're trying to determine, for example, if you have a Gaussian, you're trying to determine the mean of that Gaussian, that um, can be reduced to this sort of search. And things like, once again, this hyperparameter optimization that shows up. So these, I mentioned these as applicable areas because we've successfully already reduced these to search. Um, and so it's continuing research to see what else can we, can we bring into this framework, right? And so what does this search framework look like? So now let's talk about these components. So these next few slides, they're going to be a little bit um, mathematical, which I've heard should be just fine for this audience. Uh, but hopefully I'll be able to explain these things where if you don't necessarily uh, like the notation or don't follow it completely, 
um, it'll still make sense. So the first thing that we have in our search framework is we have a search algorithm. So this is going to be left as a black box for now. We'll talk about what that looks like in a couple slides. But you can just think of it as the thing that is searching throughout the space. You have a finite search space where uh, it contains things of value. And within that, you have some non-empty subset. And this is our target set. These are the things of value within the space. So now we have a search space, we have a searcher, and we have a target. How is the searcher going to have any hope of finding this thing? Well, we have some side information. So we have something that I call an external information resource, which I abstract as just some binary string of data. It's just some blob of data. It could represent anything you want. That's fine. But we assume that there are two methods that are implemented uh, on that. One of them being the initialization information. So you can call it kind of with this empty set, get back all the information that would be available at the beginning of your search. And then as you search the space, this little omega is one particular location in the space. So you can get feedback and say, what is the information I get back for this particular location? And so we can abstract a search problem as this triple, which is our search space, our target set, and our information resource. Okay, so that's very abstract, right? Can we make this more concrete with an example that we've already seen, binary classification? What would that look like in this framework? So our search algorithm would be the classification algorithm. So something like logistic regression or naive Bayes or a neural net or whatever your favorite algorithm is. The search space omega is the space of possible hypotheses, right? So this would be the space on the right hand side of the diagram um, that we saw initially that on the Mitchell slide. So these are the H1 through Hn. Then our target set we can choose that however we want, but something very reasonable would be to have the true labeling and then anything that's kind of close to it. So let's say within 10% error on the test set. And then our external information resource is just our training data. So this is kind of how we represent it in the machine learning world. You have your features and you have your labels. Um, and we assume that at the beginning of our search, we're given all of the training data. But we can also try to figure out how good are individual hypotheses by testing them on that data under some loss function. So we get feedback as, as to whether or not we think this is going to be a good labeling, a good hypothesis. So we have effectively uh, reduced our binary classification learning task to be representable within this framework, which is good. And so now let's talk about the search algorithm. I said it was a black box, and here's your black box. It's still there. Uh, <laughs> so we want to keep this very general because we want it to apply to a lot of things. Uh, and so what we think of as the, the algorithm, it does uh, computation, right? So it has access to a history, which are the elements that it's already seen from the search space, as well as all the information it's been given about those elements. And it performs a computation, and it produces some probability distribution over our search space. So that's kind of the main key thing that it does. It uses history to compute a probability distribution. And now, given this distribution, it samples a point, gets back some feedback, evaluates it, and then puts that back into the history and repeats. So this applies both to stochastic randomized algorithms, where it would be an actual probability distribution. Uh, if you want a determinist deterministic algorithm, you would have just a point mass distribution over one particular element. Um, so it applies very broadly. And we say that a search is successful if at the end of the search, one of these elements happens to be in the target set. But that is not a very granular way of looking at success because one algorithm may do that in a few queries, whereas another may take a lot of queries. So let's try to uh, measure our success a little bit better. So we're going to use three quantities to measure success at a finer, finer grain detail. So the first is just the baseline that we're going to look at, which is just uniform random sampling on the space. So you blindfold yourself, you try to pick elements at random, and your chances of success is P here. Then we measure the expected per query probability of success for our algorithm, which is this QT of F. And so what that means is we want to get a notion of how much probability mass we're placing on the target set over our search. And we want to do that on a per query basis, so we normalize by the number of queries. And lastly, we just take the ratio of these two things, uh, which given negative log base 2, this turns it into uh, something that's measurable in bits. 
And the reason why we use the baseline of random search is because that is an always available kind of not sophisticated strategy. And this number of bits will tell us how favorable uh, this problem is for our algorithm over uniform random sampling. So if we have a lot of bits difference, it means that we do much better than uniform random sampling. Okay, so we have all the groundwork laid. Let's talk about some results that are proven within this framework. So the first thing that I wanted to look at was for a fixed search space, a fixed algorithm, a fixed information resource, how many different search problems, how many different target sets can we do better than uniform random sampling? So we look at the set of all possible target sets in our space, and then we look at the set of target sets such that we have a B-bit advantage at least over uniform random sampling. And it turns out that the proportion of the sets where we do good over this just all sets is less than or equal to 2 to the negative B, if B is greater than or equal to 3. So this was a kind of surprising result. And what it means in English is that most of the target sets are not actually very good for a fixed algorithm with a fixed information resource. Digging in a little bit deeper as to why this was the case, it turns out that by allowing any and all possible target sets, we're going to get some target sets that have very few elements, but we're going to get an overwhelming number that have a lot of elements. And if you imagine a target set where almost the entire search space is in the target, then guess what? Uniform random sampling is going to do very well, and so it's going to be very hard to outperform it. And so while this was interesting theoretically, it wasn't what we typically care about in the real world. We spend a lot of time developing algorithms for hard problems, which is where you have very small target sets in very large spaces. And so the intuition becomes, well, maybe if I limit the size of the target set to some k that I assume is small, then that lowers the bar, because I know uniform random sampling has no chance, right? It's going to do poorly, so maybe I can do better on more problems, right? Because I only have to do a little bit better. And so we, I looked at that next, and it turns out that that intuition is actually wrong. So now if we, <laughs> right, this is a little bit disappointing. Um, so if we fix the size of the target sets to be some k, and then again, we have these two sets, so this is all possible problems. Um, here, I'm making it a little bit more general. I'm not fixing the information resource, but allowing you to have any finite set of information resources you want. And if we just look at the problems drawn from that, and then the problems drawn from that set such that we have a B-bit advantage, again, we get the same result. But now this is a little bit stronger, because now we've removed the restriction that B has to be greater than or equal to 3, and we've now allowed the information resources to either be fixed or to be just some general set. Um, and so this is very pessimistic as well. And so what is this telling us? This is telling us that most search problems for any fixed algorithm are actually really bad. And it is measurably difficult to find one such that you have an advantage over uniform random sampling. So in these cases where people want to determine um, kind of the information cost of finding a good match for your algorithm, this is a, a lower bound on it, right? So you have to have at least this much information um, to find something that you're going to do well with. Okay, so then, obviously, faced with these pessimistic results, you want to understand why this is the case and how could we escape this sort of thing. So it turns out that by allowing any pairing of target set and information resource, a lot of the information resources are not going to be very informative for the target sets. Uh, and we're effectively creating independence between the two, looking at it this way. But in the real world, we usually assume some dependence, right? So usually we assume that the target set is, or the information resource is informative about the target set. So what happens if we enforce some sort of dependence between the two? Can we escape these kind of pessimistic results? And as you probably guessed, we can. Um, so here Q, I'm, I'm kind of hiding some of the mathematical detail because this is kind of an ugly theorem if I just throw a bunch of equations on. So I've replaced it with kind of the English um, equivalence of what these things mean. But in the next uh, result, you'll get to see kind of what this ugly notation looks like. But for now, let's just look at this. So Q is now the expected per query probability of success, but now we're taking an extra expectation under some joint distribution, which is just some probabilistic relationship between our target sets and our information resource. We're assuming that that joint distribution enforces dependence such that we have uh, mutual information between the two. So that's where this dependence comes from. And what we found is now we have this nice upper bound uh, that is very interpretable. The fact that I can replace these things with English words is very, it's a very positive uh, development for me. So we have our 
mutual information. We have the predictability of the target set, so kind of how hard is it to find a, the correct target set to begin with. We have some contribution of randomness that's upper bounded by one bit. And then we have the problem difficulty measured in bits. So this is just the information cost of finding your target set. And so what this tells us is that if dependence is very small, then our expected per query probability of success is going to be correspondingly small. But to the degree that we can raise this dependence, we can hope to do better. But this is an upper bound. So can we get a lower bound? Or perhaps even better, an equality? And so what we found is this nice one equation, um, or this one line equation for why search works. And so what we have is the probability that your algorithm will select something in the target set, given one query, is, again, I, I apologize about the notation, but we'll get through this together, right? We'll walk through it. So what these things mean are we have first the mutual information between the target sets and the information resource. So again, just think about this as the dependence. How tied are these things together? We have the information leakage. So just because you have information available doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to make the best use of it. So we have to take that into account. We have this kolbeck leibler divergence, which is, I said it was the predictability of the target set. So it's saying how different is the distribution over target sets from uniform distribution, which is completely flat. So how can you be different from something flat? You could be very spiky. And when you're spiky, you're concentrating mass on very few things, which means it's very predictable. We have a, an entropy term, which is the contribution of just sheer random luck, absent everything else, upper bounded by a bit again. We have a correction term, because as you notice, this is a probability. So these things have to be between zero and one at all times. So that kind of takes care of that. We have the information cost, which is just the target coverage and then the negative log base two of that. And then lastly, we have this guy. So what is that? This is like a structural information term. So what it's saying is how different does your distribution over target sets become if you already know one of the elements in the target set? And so if you have this strong structure to your target set, then now you can basically determine the rest of the target set given one element, whereas if the target set doesn't really have structure, it doesn't really help you that much, right? So that's what that captures. So this is nice. This will tell us um, in a way that we already know that dependence is important. We already know that it's important to not lose information. We know that it's important to have these things be predictable. We know that it's important whether or not it's a hard problem. So this ties together a lot of things that we intuitively know should help us or harm us in, in one nice equation. Okay, so that was the theoretical results. Those were, that's kind of the more, most mathy part of this. I think I have one more equation, or one more slide with equations. Uh, but what is this useful for? So we want to be able to apply this to real world problems in the end. So what did we learn? We learned the importance of dependence. We saw that most problems are a poor fit for any algorithm. This was kind of these first two results that I view as kind of pessimistic, right? And that if T is independent of F, then success becomes unlikely. But dependence can raise the expected probability of success. And so this, in my mind, leads very naturally to what I think of as a dependence first view of learning, which is whenever I encounter a new problem area or a new problem, the first question I ask myself is, what dependencies exist there? Because those are the things that we're going to be able to exploit in order, in order to get better than random chance performance. And in machine learning, one place where dependence is often used is in this notion of smoothness or regularity. You may have heard these terms before. And we can visualize smoothness as a type of dependence. So what smoothness is saying is that if I know the value of x here, I also know something about values that are nearby. They can't be too different from what x is. And that could exist either in time or space. And so if we know something about an observed sample, then we kind of know something about things we haven't observed. Again, this dependence becomes very important. And we could exploit this. We could exploit this temporally or in um, space. And so one place that we're going to do it is in this real world problem of hyperparameter optimization. So raise your hand if you've ever heard this term or phrase before. That's actually a really good number. So <laughs> usually I, I assume um, the people have not heard this term. So you guys are already a step ahead of, it, of the rest of the world. Um, so I will discuss what hyperparameter optimization is if you haven't heard the term. So. Virtually every machine learning method has these tuning knobs that need to be set. We call them hyperparameters. And you need to set them before you ever see any data. And some of them have several of these. And we saw that methods can only work well on a small subset of problems, right? So these were the, the theoretical results we found. And so what that means 
is that either we have to keep making new methods as we run into new problems, or we can wisen up and say, well, maybe we'll just build flexible models that could be sensitive to their parameterization, such that if we change the parameterization, it's as if we're getting a new algorithm, right? It could behave different depending on how we set these things. And we see an emerging trend towards the latter in modern machine learning. So you have things like vision architectures or deep learning or uh, these other methods that have a lot of hyperparameters. But this raises a problem, right? So we want hyperparameter optimization, we want to be able to solve it, but we may need to move to automated hyperparameterization because flexible methods often have several hyperparameters. And we saw that different settings can lead to dramatic performance differences because effectively they're acting like different algorithms. And so this raises a question is, how would a non-expert even know how to begin setting these things? We don't want people to have to have a PhD in data science in order to use machine learning methods, right? We want to democratize it. Um, in the same way that you don't have to have a PhD in um, systems to be able to use a computer. You don't have to know how to design a computer, right? And what we really, really want to move away from are what I think of as the dark arts of hyperparameter <laughs> tuning, where we're forced to rely on uh, this esoteric priesthood of experts who are able to set these things and everybody else is kind of at their mercy. And so, yes, this may sound like good job security for somebody in data science, <laughs> but even data scientists among themselves, we want a principled way of doing these things because we want data science. We don't want a data seance, right? We don't want to just say, I know it when I see it. I'll just feel my way using the force. Okay, so this very naturally leads to trying to do this in an automated way. So I must say that this is joint work with Tom Finley at Microsoft, and we have looked at this problem um, at trying to set these hyperparameters in an automated way. So we have as data a space of hyperparameters. So this is the different possible uh, settings we can have on our knobs. And then we have a data set that can fit, consists of configuration performance pairs. So a configuration is just some particular setting of the knobs and the performance that we observe under those settings. So our task is to recover a configuration with good performance. And we have an insight. For this thing to be tractable, the configurations that we observe have to be correlated some way uh, with the unobserved configurations. And one way for that to happen is spatial dependence. So this is the assumption we're going to make and what we're going to exploit to do better than random uniform sampling. So we've developed a method called kernel density optimization, um, which is based on kernel density estimation, if you've heard that. And so as a, a kind of a funny aside, when we were developing this method, uh, Tom would talk to people about what we're working on. He'd say, oh, yeah, we're working on kernel density optimization. Everyone would always correct him. They're like, oh, you mean kernel density estimation? He said, no, I mean kernel density <laughs> optimization. Uh, so we begin by rescaling our numerical hyperparameters to a unit cube. So you can imagine just this glass box, which will be our search space. And within the glass box, we can imagine there's some kind of smoke. And so that smoke you can think of as the probability mass. It's going to be very dense in some regions, and it's going to be more dilute in others. And so we want to model the performance of these different configurations using a probability model. Right? And so we use weighted kernel density estimation, which is a statistical technique. If you don't know what that is, don't worry about it. It's just a way of modeling this probability mass within our search space. And a difference from kernel density estimation, if you've ever used it, is that we use configuration-specific bandwidths, which would mean something if you've looked at this before. If not, it's just a way of spreading out that probability mass away from regions that are poor performing and concentrating it in regions that are good performing. And so this is kind of, you can think of it as like a fitness-based scaling. So depending on how good an observation is, we want to scale this thing appropriately. And it takes advantage of the spatial regularity that we talked about. You're assuming that if you see something good here, the things nearby are also going to be good. So it's, it's a, an assumption that we make. And the nice thing about KDO is that we can sample directly from our probabilistic model. So a lot of methods that have been developed to solve this problem develop a nice, very nice probabilistic model, but you can't actually sample from it. You have to just pick random configurations and then rank them using your model and then try to pick from that. So this is good because now it's very efficient to just get the next point that we're going to query. And so this is the, the last slide with equations. Um, I just wanted to show you in case you're curious about what the probability model looks like. Right here is kind of the important part. It's just a weighted KDE. And this part just shows you how you're setting the weights uh, you notice that the bandwidths are different. 
Um, and if this doesn't mean anything to you, that's fine. It doesn't, <laughs> it's just if you're curious, right? So this is what the model looks like. But what it does at a high level, this is maybe more informative. So this concentration of the probability mass, you can actually see it play out as we take different snapshots of the performance of uh, one of these algorithms. So here we've taken the first 50 iterations of a hyperparameter optimization problem, the middle 50, and then the final 50. And for each of those 50 iterations, we built basically a smooth histogram of where the performance values are concentrated. So initially, we initialize using uniform random sampling, and we see that everything kind of looks like uniform random sampling, which is expected. The regions of good performance are on the right, of poor performance are on the left, and this is kind of like the mean performance. As we move to the middle 50 iterations, we see that KDO, which is this red line here, is beginning to concentrate its mass towards the right of the diagram. So these are the regions of good performance, which is what we want. And then the final 50, we see that there's a large spike, so there's a large concentration over a region of good performance. And so we don't want to sample from regions that have poor performance. So the fact that all of the samples it got were from these regions of good performance means that not only are we finding good configurations, but we're consistently exploiting that as well, such that our samples are typically from good regions. And so we tested this, right? We want to see, does this actually work in the real world on real problems? And so we use different learning methods, things like perceptrons, logistic regression, um, that have things like L1 penalties, L2 penalties, uh, different optimization tolerances, uh, and then we used gradient boosted trees, which are ensemble methods. And some of these have a lot of hyperparameters that need to be set. We looked at different UCI data sets for binary classification problems. And lastly, we have a 50-dimensional rastrogen function, which is just some synthetic optimization problem. Uh, but the other ones are all real-world problems. Okay, so we ran these algorithms. We compared against LDS, which is a low discrepancy sequence, which is a Sobel grid filling space method, or space filling grid method, uh, where we're just doing a grid search, right? Uh, Nelder Mead, which is this classical optimization approach. SMAC, which is a sequential model-based um, optimization method. It's kind of a uh, state of the art. And then random is just uniform random sampling on the space. And we kept track of the best performance we had seen so far, over 500 iterations. We did that 100 independent trials and then took means and built 95% confidence intervals. Right? So this is what these graphs mean. And so what we see is that KDO is for the adult tiny data set and the breast cancer data set are significantly outperforming some of these other methods. Right? So there's a clear separation um, in performance. The confidence intervals are not overlapping. This trend continues to hold for all the other real-world data sets as well. So you kind of see it's usually this ranking. So with KDO and then SMAC and then uniform random sampling does something um, not as good. Um, and the same thing even if we move to ensemble methods, gradient boosted trees. So the one outlier was the synthetic um, function. So in this case, KDO and SMAC performed roughly the same, except for SMAC kind of overtook KDO at the end. But the real surprise was that Nelder Mead, in this case, performed very well. So in the other cases, it actually performed pretty poorly. In this one, it, it, it did well. And even more interesting is low discrepancy sequences, which I didn't plot. They actually did perfect. So within one query, it was able to minimize the function. Because for a rastrogen function, the minimum is at the exact center, and LDS begins its search at the exact center. So kind of coincidentally, it did very well. Not really informative, but so I, I didn't plot it on here. Okay. So we've seen um, that KDO is doing something of value in the real world. Um, and where do I want to go with this? So these are things that I've worked on so far. Obviously, in the short term, there's a lot of ways to extend these things, right? So I would like to extend this search framework to compact continuous spaces. So far, I've just looked at these discrete finite spaces. And it turns out that sometimes when you're looking at these sorts of results, you can't just directly apply them to the continuous setting because sometimes they don't transfer. So that's an immediate area. And then also trying to extend this to other areas of machine learning. So now it's kind of a hobby of mine. When I hear of some area of learning I didn't know about, I'm like, can I represent that as a search? And like, can I do that formally to include it in my, my dissertation specifically? <laughs> and then. We've assumed in this process that the target set is fixed and the information resource is fixed. But sometimes these things vary as you're doing your search. 
So what would happen if we have our objective function, our information resource changing in a time-varying manner? Or what if our targets were drifting? What would that do to some of these results? And then also trying to not just reconcile, but also rederive a lot of results from statistical learning theory within this framework. Um, so this is a very exciting area as well, because then it will show kind of the, the power and the generality of this way of looking at machine learning. And on the longer term side, I want to resolve what I think of as the learning regress. So the same Tom Mitchell who wrote the paper on generalization of search wrote another paper in which he showed that classification algorithms that didn't make any assumptions beyond just strict consistency with training data couldn't actually learn. So there, it was a goal at the time to make unbiased algorithms, these things that could learn anything equally well. And when you do that, what ends up happening is you get a rote memorizer. So it is able to perfectly reproduce what it's seen in training, but as soon as you give it something that it hasn't seen in training, it effectively just flips a coin to come up with the, lab the label. Furthermore, Dave Wolpert showed in 2001 that it's not enough to just have a biased algorithm. You actually have to have correct biases. Right? You can't just make any assumptions. You have to make correct assumptions if you want to improve your performance. And he argued geometrically that you have to basically align to what holds in the real world. And so in my mind, this raises an immediate question, which is how do we learn correct biases? Because I've just said that you need correct biases to learn, so how do you learn correct biases in the first place? This seems to be a higher level learning problem or search problem. And so this raises another question. Does the learning process get easier as we move up the learning hierarchy? Because it seems like almost like an infinite regress when you pose it like this, right? And so there's two intuitions that we can have about this. So on one hand, someone might argue, well, why would you expect it to get any easier? This sounds like the exact same type of problem. It sounds like a regress. And that's a valid intuition. You may have that, and I can't really argue against that at this point. However, there's another intuition you might have, which is that sometimes just moving up one level can change things, right? So when you're a small child and you lose a tooth, you get money. But when you're an adult and you lose a tooth, you have to pay money, right? <laughs> so just moving up one level dramatically changed how this thing happens in the real world. So my hope is that maybe something similar happens here. Um, and I really want to nail this down formally and quantitatively. And so with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'd like to take any questions you might have on this. <laughs>